coming in today, but um, the live wires, I think, are still heading out this morning. Um, so if you're little, five and under, you can still head into the side room today. Bless you. So this morning, um, my message is called, um, uh, What Did Jesus Do For Us? And it's a bit of a follow-on from the last couple of weeks. But um, firstly, I just wanted to say that uh, Maya has had her baby, a little little girl. So that's pretty exciting. And uh, Zathina. So um, that's really fantastic. We, um, we prayed for her on Thursday night. And boom! On Friday, it came. So if you're pregnant and you need things to happen more quickly, you come and, uh, and on Thursday night you get prayed for. Uh, so that's fantastic. Um, we're really, really, really thankful there, and things went really well, so um, that was a, a, a great thing. Um, so this morning, it's just, what has Jesus, what, or what did Jesus do for us? You know, um, it's just, I just want to lay a bit of a foundation here with some things, and, and, um, and just say this, that there, there's many reasons why we do the things that we do in our lives, why we behave like we do, why we feel like we do, um, and it's, you know, through no fault of our own, no choice of our own, were we born into the place that we were born into. You didn't get to choose from a list of parents um, up in heaven and say, oh, oh, not them. No, 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 not them. Oh, 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 these guys look really good. You didn't get to choose that. You, it, was just, it, was just, it just happened. And, uh, of course, sometimes we think that it's just a random thing, but it's actually not. Um, see, God doesn't do anything random like that. Um, he doesn't just, you know, spin the big wheel and, oh, these are your parents. No, it's actually um, part of a purpose. And um, so we were born into the families and we just received everything that came down generationally from our ancestors and parents and da-da-da. You don't get a choice of that, you just, you just got it. And, um, and our parents, um, they too had no choice and through no fault of their own, they were born into the situation um, that they were in. But it just wasn't random. And um, people, people can have problems by choice or by chance. And the Bible talks a bit, a bit about this. You, 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 it's a choice to live like this, or um, it might just be the chance, the, the, what you've been given. Um, but, you know, we have a choice with how we can live and what we're going to do and where we're going to, who we're going to follow and what we're going to believe in. And, um, you, know, do, you know, this might be a bit of a shock. Could be a shock to some people, but, but I want to just get it out there. Um, did you know that you have a choice between being grumpy or happy? Now, you might say, I wake up in the morning and I'm grumpy. Or I, if I wake up happy, then awesome. And everyone around me is going to have a good day. But if I wake up grumpy, everyone around me, they around me they're going to, I'm going to make sure they have a bad day as well. I, I worked in this bike shop um, uh, for a few months before uh, we came up here. And um, there, was this, there was this red-headed um, uh, mechanic. And he had a red beard, great big beard. He, he was later on uh, TV in the, this pro tour thing and, and, he, and a, a, a cyclist had broken down and on his bike and, and here's this guy jumped out of the vehicle, massive red beard and I knew exactly who it was and this awesome. But anyway, he's a bit fiery and um, what he would do about 9.30 in the morning, he'd start ranting and raving, oh, 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 this day sucks and blah, blah, blah. And I said, after a while I said, look mate, I'm a bit tired of you, carry on. You know, I leave, I leave the judgment of the day till about 4.30 in the afternoon. Because, you see, you've written a day off way too early, mate. What if it improves? You'll miss it. And um, he was like, yeah, but I'm angry now. And I said, oh, anyway, we changed his, we tried to, I changed his behavior. And um, it was actually quite good. And then he, he, if he was going to rant and rave, it was later in the day. And we could all leave, and, and leave him to it. Um, but you, you can choose to be bitter or sweet. It's a choice. It's not how you wake up. It's not some random thing. I, I read out last week about the, um, you know, the fruit of the Holy Spirit, and one of the things was patience. And interestingly enough, it's not, what, not the waiting that's really the problem, it's what you do while you wait. And we can choose to, to um, be all grumpy and angry and annoyed at God because he's slow at answering our prayers, or we can keep walking in faith in the Spirit um, and, um, and actually choose God's way and God's love and his peace and his joy and so on instead. So our parents, just like us, were born into the corruption of this world. Got no choice. They weren't perfect and they, they all make mistakes. And in my opinion, um, I don't think there's a parent alive that doesn't regret the things that they've, some of the things they've done and said to their kids. You cannot, surely you, you're a human being, you can't go through your life and do it all perfect for your kids. And I'm sure the kids have, have been annoyed with things that the parents have done and said and all that. But you can't put it back. You can't have a do-over. Has anyone seen that movie Groundhog Day? 
and he thinks, oh man, I, I, I mucked this up, I'm going to go back and change just that, but of course it changed a whole lot of other things, <laughs> and then he had to keep changing and changing, and eventually he just thought, you know what, I'm just going to wake up and whatever happens on that day happens. You love to have a do-over at times, but it can change some things, and then you may not learn the lesson um, that actually was right there. So parents weren't perfect. Um, now, you could have, uh, there can be some things happen. While your mother was pregnant, there can be some things happen in your life, like there could be a death of a loved one in the family, and it can cause trauma and shock and horror and other things, and that gets, can get passed down into the little baby. Maybe there's financial pressures or work issues or relationship problems, there's a bit of violence or whatever it might be, and this all gets passed into you. And these things can actually end up meaning that we feel rejected, unwanted, depressed, anxious, have a death wish, afraid of death, violent, angry, defensive, aggressive, controlling and the list goes on and on and it's all part and parcel of being born into the corruption of this world now you might say that's so unfair i don't like this and you can get all stroppy and all carry it on and, and you go and talk to god about it and um but you must let if you're going to complain to god about it you must let him speak to you and explain what's going on because you might just find you're wrong I've found out this week that God is much more cleverer than I am. Boy, that's, that's a tough thing, man, when you realise that stuff. And maybe some of my reactions and words just aren't all that flash, and maybe, you know, and I had to repent of some things. But, you know, um, th there can be a number of different things. That is, we're all just born into this corruption, and there's just a number of things that we can't control, um, except we can control our reaction to them. So as long as the foundation or root of your life is in this corruption, you're going to come under it. That makes sense, eh? Unless you choose to come out from underneath that, you're going to live underneath that corruption of this world, under its regime, under its control. That means if you're feeling oppressed, or people are oppressing you, um, you will have to live under that oppression, because in this corrupt world, you don't get a choice. Unless God actually has a solution for it. And it's quite amazing. Um, and I've found that um, through my own life and looking at other people, that sometimes what's inside me can do some stuff and I will actually hurt people who love me and I will hurt the people who I love. And I don't want to do that. It, it, it annoys me. Why would I want to do that? It's so counterproductive. But sometimes rejected people, for an example, um, reject people. So if I feel rejected, but then I reject people, and I push people away, and then when they go because they just can't, they can't handle it, it's too hard, then um, they feel rejected, I feel rejected, and hurt people hurt people, and now our rejection is now rejecting each other, and we all feel rejected, and nobody's actually, um, what's happening? Sometimes I could torpedo relationships because for whatever reason, and it's illogical, I don't understand, I can torpedo relationships, and the cycle goes on and on and on and on unless... Something's got to happen. Something's got to shift. And in other, you know, in other words, what I'm saying is the brokenness that we have inside, um, you know, uh, needs to be healed. And this is the, you know, the great thing is, I, and I love this. Jesus came to heal the brokenhearted. Yeah, Isn't that awesome? Yeah. This is what he came to do. And that's what I was saying this morning. If you open your heart to Jesus, he stands at the door and knocks. And one of the one of the ways that this is depicted is that it's that actually God, our Father. The Holy Spirit and Jesus, all three of them stand at the door and knock. Because they all have a slightly different thing that they, they do, even though they're one in perfect unity. But there's certain things that God does, certain things that the Holy Spirit does, and certain things that Jesus do to help us understand and receive some things. So as long as you choose this world's corruption, you are subject to its regime. Its oppressions, its burdens, and, it's, and look, it's a whole lot of burdens that we aren't designed to carry either. So you might feel that it's not fair. Well, as I say, you go and have a talk to Jesus, um, and, uh, and, and he can explain some things to you, but you must listen to his, what he says. You must listen to that. Because you start making up your own mind um, and your own version of events, I can guarantee it's gonna, there's going to be a bit of, there's going to be too, too much flesh stuff in there and not enough spirit. So I have to choose uh, what I'm going to live under. Am I going to choose to live under the anointing of Jesus Christ? Or am I going to live under the corruption of this world? Now, we may end up treating people um, poorly. Um, and um, 
you know, let me ask you this. Do, when we treat people poorly, do they deserve it? Now, I know sometimes you probably feel like you do. They do. Um, we probably feel we probably deserve sometimes. But, but you know, when, when Jesus um, deals with us, you know how consistent Jesus is? He says in 1 John 1, 9, If you confess your sins, I am faithful and just to forgive you of your sins and cleanse you from all unrighteousness. Now, you imagine if you came to Jesus and you asked him that, and he said, Nah, not today, mate. I woke up grumpy. Nah. Well, you know, one or two times like that and you won't go to Jesus anymore, will you? But he is so consistent. He is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins. Faithful and just to forgive us of our sins. Just The justice is, I will do what I say in my word. He is faithful to do what he says in his word. And this is so important. Can we give that consistency to other people who don't deserve it? Because we certainly don't deserve what Jesus has done for us. And this is, um, this is a bit of our homework from last week as well, you know, to, to love people unconditionally just like Jesus loves us con- unconditionally. Now, this is one of the most challenging things you will hear ever in your life. <laughs> Can you be more like Jesus? Can you, you see, Jesus said he came meek and mild and humble. He came to serve and not to be served. Kings don't do this, do they? Kings of this world, they don't do that because, you see, the devil's perverted what God has set up God's way he's man's perverted that and shifted it now people think that this is the way man's way is the way I mean you know think about all these movies um how many movies are there where the superhero human being saves the whole world yeah so the message we can save the world mate man we've got all the answers everyone buy electric vehicles and you'll save the planet did you know that we may not be able to generate enough electricity to power them all, but no worries. You have one, you know, because then you think, oh, the, the, the car can't charge, so I'll use my bike. Just buy bikes and be done with it. Shortcut the whole electric car thing. Hallelujah. Um, but is it, fair, is it fair that we pass on what Jesus gives to us, that consistency that Jesus gives? Can we pass that on to some other people in some sort of way? But the truth is that there's something that can be done about our situation because um, in the Old Testament, God stood there and he, he said to the Israelites, he said, I have placed before you life and death. So it's a multi choice thing. You know, God's schooling them. It's a multi choice, A or B. And then he says to them, um, Choose life. He gives you the answer. Choose life. And then he goes on to talk about all the things that the life comes with, the abundance and the, you know, all the blessing of God and all that sort of stuff. And, um, but, and then he talks about what the death that comes if you choose that. Now, when you put it like this, you think, why on earth would people want to choose death? Sometimes people are a bit thick. But, you know, when you think about it, it's the flesh that's thick. And the spirit is alive with the life of Jesus Christ. So where would you want to live? In the flesh that's thick? and a bit dull, and a bit slow, wants to choose death? Or would you want to live in the spirit that wants to choose life? Now, so today, you know, you can, you can be saved by Jesus. You can be saved from the sin and death, the corruption of this world, provided you choose Jesus over yourself, over, over other people, and over things. But you know what? The flesh will always oppose the spirit. You may have woken up this morning and thought, oh, I can't be bothered going to church. You know, Clint sucks. Here's a dumb message. Yeah. You might think that. But, you know, if you stop for a moment and think, oh, now is this my flesh or is it this the spirit? Is one giving life or what's, what's happening there? The flesh will always oppose the, 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 what the spirit is doing. And this is a bit of a problem, even for Christians. You see, even for Christians, our flesh can still oppose the Spirit of God. Now, I, I don't like to hear that. I don't like to think that because I think, I am all for you, Jesus. But the problem is I live in this, uh, this, you know, in this world and, and I don't want to. I don't want to, be, I want to be in the world but not of it. And I don't want to be in the flesh. I want to be in the spirit. But as the Apostle Paul says, I do what I don't want to do and what I don't want to do I end up doing. And he, and he has this sort of cryptic sort of funny thing about, about life. And we all know what that's like. 
But this is the corruption, and, and, and the flesh, it will, it, will, it will oppose the Spirit of God. And, and if you're in the flesh, you, you won't want to come to church, you won't want to pray, you won't want to do, and you won't want to hear what God's got to say to you because your flesh doesn't want to know about it. doesn't want to know. It wants to sit at home and do nothing, um, watch YouTube, and there's some great stuff on YouTube. Oops. It's easy to move from the spirit into the flesh at times. And, um, and, and, and you know, there's some things, that there's, just, there's some good stuff there, but there's also the temptations right next to it. You notice that? So when we are born again and we're set free from the corruption that we are born into, we are now a new creation adopted into the whānau of God, into the family of God, and now we're one of his kids. We're co-heirs with Jesus, and we're lifted up in Jesus' name. We're now seated in high places, and we defend that position. We don't need to fight to get it. Because Jesus has already won that battle. You know, if you're in war and you're in the top of a hill or a mountain, it only takes about 10 people to defend that and 100 or more people to take it. The battle's already been won. There's been a parade. There's been a parade. The devil and his demons and everything that have been defeated have been paraded down the street and everyone can see it. But half the time we, we spend, we're just, Lord, please, you know, we, we're crying out to God to do some things that he's already done. You've already got it. He's already done it. He, everything is under Jesus' feet. And now, we, if we, once we're born again, we are now born of incorruptible, imperishable, immortal seed. Did you hear the first one? No more corruption. We are incorruptible seed. This is so good. This is what we are now. Not anything else. And when the devil comes to tempt you to say, well, you're just blah, 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 um, you can say no. And this is why it's really important for us to know and understand exactly what Jesus has done for us by dying on the cross and being raised from the dead. Because if we don't know what he's done, how do we defend it? That makes sense, eh? And this is one of the amazing things that happens when you read the Bible. You read it and you say, yes. And now you choose to come into agreement with the word of God. So we're covered by the blood of Jesus and, um, and, and we're, we're, we're not covered by anything else. And now in legal terms, there's no one has a legal right over us anymore because we are paid for by Jesus. He's paid that price. So we don't have to go to court anymore and stand there in, in this judgment of the world that you are sinful, you're corrupt, you need deserve to be punished. No, Jesus has taken all that and now we're free. So Jesus comes to heal the brokenhearted and set the captives free. And this is why we, he stands at the door and he knocks and we have to open it. The picture in, um, in the, the cathedral, one of the cathedrals in, in England, is there's a picture uh, that a paint, famous painter's painted and someone said to him, oh, you've, you've missed something on there. And the guy said, oh, what's that? And he said, well, there's no handle for Jesus to open the door. And the guy says, no, that's on purpose. See, the handle's on the inside. We have to open the door. Jesus just stands on the door and knocks. We have to choose to let him in. And will you choose to let him in to fulfill his ministry in our lives? Will you do that? Can we do that? To heal the brokenhearted and to set the captives free. So now we wear the righteous clothing of Jesus Christ over us. And so we're acceptable to God. When God looks at us, he sees the blood of Jesus on us. We're covered over and now we're acceptable to him. It means we can come into the very presence of God. And if you know the, know the story about when Jesus was crucified, the curtain was ripped in the temple. And that Holy of Holies, it, it stopped, you see, as the high priest was the only one who could go into the Holy of Holies, and then only once a year, and he had to cleanse himself and all this sort of stuff, and he could only go once a year. Um, and there was a story that circulated for a while about they tied a rope around his ankle, so just in case he died while he was in there because he was, had been a naughty boy and hadn't cleansed himself, they could pull him out. Well, apparently that was a load of rubbish, but, but it went circulated for a wee while. But, um, but he would make sure if you had the, the fear of death going into the tent, you would make sure you were cleansed, day. Eh? You wouldn't sort of walk in there, yo, what up? up to? No, you would, man, I could die. I'm going to sort this out. I'm going to cleanse myself. And so now that's been ripped and now we can all come into the Holy of Holies. And so when we're praising and worshipping, we can come into the very presence of God, not, not walking in. You know, no, we, we, we come in confidently, but we come low and humble. You see, if Jesus can come into this world humble and gentle 
and meek and mild, and to serve and not to be served, surely we can come into the heaven, like uh, into the kingdom of, well, sorry, into the presence of God like that too. <laughs> we should, um, because you know, uh, and and you know, before you go and repent, and it will be necessary. I can tell you, um, humble yourself. You think, oh, well, I don't have to. Well, I would do that because there's no room for pride and ego in his presence. So we looked last week at the, um, at the Sabbath rest of God. And the Sabbath, Jesus said that the Sabbath was made for man, not man for the Sabbath. The Sabbath does not trump man. Sorry to use trump. Because I was going to say the Sabbath does not bide in man, but then that doesn't work either, eh? So I trump. Um, but, but, you know, the, the Sabbath does not trump man. The Sabbath was made for man's benefit. Praise God for that. And then Jesus said something else. He said, you know, the Son of Man is Lord even of the Sabbath. Because you see, the Pharisees, what they've done is elevated the Sabbath and said, if you keep these Sabbath laws on the Sabbath, you can be holy and acceptable to God. They were giving people a burden to carry that they weren't supposed to carry. They couldn't. Because every time they turned around, there was some new law, some new rule. As I said last week, the Essens, um, where John the Baptist was born into, um, if you, they felt doing number twos on, um, on the Sabbath was work. So you couldn't do it. There's a lot of people walking around very uncomfortable um, you know, on the Sabbath. Be careful what you ate on the day before. Maybe that's why they fasted the day before. But, you know, you can't earn self-righteousness. You can't earn that righteousness. And so the Pharisees had lost the spirit in which the law was given. They'd forgotten, they'd missed it. Why? Because they were in the flesh, and it was all about their flesh nature, and it actually opposed the spirit of God. And when the Son of God, Jesus, came, who gave the law and gave the word, they wouldn't even let the guy who made the law up talk them out of it. Wrong with these people. I mean, this is, but you see, there's thickness and denseness and dullness in the flesh. We need to be in the spirit. That lost the spirit in which the law had been given. And we will often think of the law as restrictive and, and hard and difficult and overbearing and all that sort of stuff. But it's actually not. Because when you understand and have a revelation of what the spirit of the, it was given in, you will understand that it actually brings life. Things like, don't steal. Well, I want to steal. Well, enjoy prison. Well, I don't want to go to prison. Hmm. But the flesh will always oppose the spirit because they're enemies. And, the, and as I said, the flesh can and does oppose what the Holy Spirit is doing in our own life and in others' lives and in the um, lives of, of the people in our community. That's why we walk in the spirit. That's why, as the Bible talks about, we die to the flesh. We were, the flesh was crucified with Jesus and now we're raised up as a new creation. That's what happens when we're born again. And of course, baptism does that. It's a symbolic of dying, being buried in the water. Now we're raised up as a new creation. And we need to be because the corruption we've been born into is this overbearing, terrible regime that we need to be out of. And praise God for that. As I said, I, I read out the, um, the, the fruit of the fleshly, de and lust, uh, fleshly desires and lusts last week and the fruit of the Spirit. And it's relatively easy to discern between those two when you read them out and you think, oh yeah, uh, yeah, that makes sense. And oh yeah, that makes sense. Um, but the problem is that, um, you know, sometimes we jolly well like some things. And you will never give up anything you love. So if you love stealing, <laughs> you need to read the Bible and it says, do not steal. And you go, oh, God doesn't like stealing. It's dishonest. So therefore, Lord, I want to hate stealing as well. Please, Lord, help me to hate the stealing. And God, this is what God wants us to come to him and totally rely on him for stuff. This is what he wants. Now, just to explain the fruit thing, because um, um, just to make that clear, um, so if you imagine we are like a tree, we're like a fruit tree, and, and on, uh, on us grows fruit, and, um, and that fruit, it's, it, you, you can imagine someone coming along to the fruit of your tree, you, you, you're this tree, and they come along and they pick the fruit and they eat it. And the Bible says that you taste and see that the Lord is good. Well, we're his hands and his feet, we're actually those ones who grow his fruit, 
And, but when people pick the fruit of our lives and they hear what we say and what we do, do they taste bitterness? Do they taste unforgiveness? Do they taste an anger and a resentment and a depression? Do they taste those things? Or do they taste and see that the Lord is good and sweet? You see, we, when we are born again, we can end up in this place where there's still some things in our lives that are still producing bad fruit. And we need to deal with those. Why? Because Jesus says, I come to heal the brokenhearted. And if your, bro- your broken heart will make broken fruit. That makes sense. And so um, you know, the very interesting thing is that if you've got bad fruit in your life and, it's, and, and there's, a, there's a fix to it, so don't think that you're, just, you're doomed, there's actually a fix to it. Jesus has come to set you free so that we produce good fruit. Um, but did you know that you can't stop producing bad fruit simply by removing the bad fruit? You'll just keep on producing what's in you. Um, and the, inter- the, great, the amazing thing is that you, you know, we've been grafted into the vine, which is Jesus Christ. He's that rootstock. And if you know anything about grapevines, you, know, you, you graft in the new one into the, the rootstock. The rootstock has been around for, it could be generations. And it's established, it's, it's well founded, it's, the roots go deep, um, it's, it's not going to die or anytime soon. And so you graft this new piece of little, little branch into that and you bind it together and it eventually grows together and you can take off the binding, you can still see the scar where it's there. So this is a picture of what it's like for us. Now we're grafted into this vine and now we're beginning to receive all of our nutrients and stuff from Jesus. Not from the corrupt world that we were part of before. But the, we, we can have this, some issues in our lives that, that we need to deal with, otherwise we're gonna, we're gonna, there might be this residue of, of bad fruit. And you know, whatever is in the garden of your life, when it starts to rain, and the conditions are good, it will grow, whether it's good or bad. And so you can't, you can't start producing good fruit simply by removing the old. We need to go back into the root cause of it. Why? And you see, the problem is that we can end up having this residue left over from the corruption, and, um, and we need to be set free from that. But we're adopted into the family of God. We are co-heirs with Jesus. We're seated in high places. We're above and not below, and we're the head and not the tail. Once we're born again, there's a healing that begins to take place in our lives. Jesus starts to do his work. Did you know that um, you know, when Jesus was walking on the earth and he went to the temple and um, they were, there were money changers in there and they were ripping people off so people would come and they would buy sacrifices to give to the Lord and people would rip them off. They had false weights and measures and it was, it was, there was corruption there. What did Jesus do? He drove them out. Get out of here. He made a whip. And he whipped them. And got them out, turned over their tables. And this is, you know, now in the spirit, this is exactly what Jesus does in our lives. He drives out the corruption of our lives, but we have to let him. If you, if you just, no, I'm going to hold on to that because I like it. <laughs> Jesus, what can Jesus do about it? He's not going to force it. He won't make you. We have to choose. You see, the kingdom of heaven is about us, um, or what Jesus has done, of course, what God's done is mercy and his grace. But it's also about what are we going to choose? Do we choose to follow him or not? So we need to submit to him. But what happens is that the growth and maturity means that we have this, this ongoing healing, an ongoing setting free. It's, um, you can put it like this, that you know, when you're saved, you're sanctified, set apart for God. But then after that, there's a process of sanctification. We're becoming more and more like Jesus Christ. And that's what we want to be. And we all need to be healed and set free of things because there are just some things that we're holding on to or we may not even realise we have. But we need to let Jesus drive out the, the corruption of the world, the residue that may be there, the hurt or the pain or the difficulties or whatever it is. We need to let Jesus drive it out so we can become more like him. But it means dealing with the root causes of it. And the Holy Spirit will uh, guide and counsel us through it. This is called character development. Um, I've seen this many times, experienced myself. It's relatively easy, especially for some people, to grow their ministry. They might be charismatic, they might be whatever it is, and it's easy enough to grow their ministry. But if they don't walk at work on their character, what happens is you end up with this upside down pyramid type shape, and you've got the big ministry on top and the little witty bitty balancing act on a uh, bit of character. 
Now, we all know that if, if we can elevate ourselves and push ourselves up and, 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 and so try and shortcut what God is doing, because, but if we humble ourselves under the mighty hand of God, submit to him, he will exalt us and elevate us at the right time when we are ready. Because what we want to do is work on our character and have the pyramid shaped like this where the character's on the bottom and the ministry is on top. Because you see, otherwise the bigger it gets, the bigger the ministry gets, and the, and the less you do with character, um, it's going to topple over. You can, it's, it's pretty easy to understand that, that concept. But this is the thing. The growth and maturity and discipline from Jesus actually grows. He works on our character. The ministry just happens along the way. But it, we need to let, to let Jesus work on our character, to remove the corruption. You know, what I've found so often is that Jesus wants, God wants me to deal with something in my life. He confronts me with some things because he knows a month or a week or a couple of whatever's down the track, guess what's going to happen? It's going to be a whole lot worse. And if I deal with it now, um, it, he's actually preparing me. It's almost as if God could see the end from the beginning. He can see the whole thing. He has the whole universe in the span of his hand. I mean, he has to look pretty carefully down to see little wee moulded dirt like you and I. But he does. He does. You know, there was a verse I read out last week from Jeremiah, and it was that um, I, am, I am a holy and mighty God. I am high and lifted up in a holy place, yet I choose to dwell with the lowly and the contrite and the broken so that I can lift them up. Praise God for that. It's just so amazing. So when we're confronted with ourselves or a certain behavior, how do we react? Are we prepared to look in the mirror with self-critical or critical self-evaluation and say, whoa, maybe I had a problem with my reaction or my, this is maybe my issue, or do we just blame shift it and, and say it's someone else's fault? But, you know, if you're honest, if you're honest with yourself, we can all clearly see the need for Jesus' healing and ministry in our lives. There is no, there's no doubt. We all need that. Um, one of the interesting things is that um, when we remove the log from our own eye, you know, it says that remove the, first remove the log out of your own eye before, you know, so you can remove the speck out of someone else's eye. But you know what? What I've found is when I remove the log out of my own eye, I can't see the speck anymore. What's happened? You know, the log tends to be a bit of a restrictive thing uh, to look through. Uh, a few years ago, I did a message and I made some, um, uh, some glasses out of a bit of 4x2. And I wore them. It was hard to see anything. I just got some splinters in my eye. Maybe they were the specs. But you see, if we remove that log, but then once that's happened, then we realise we are so thankful and humble before God that now we can help other people, not because we see their fault, but because we want to help them like Jesus has helped us. And it's a totally different perspective from uh, looking through um, at someone else's problem um, with the log in your eye. And, and it's a totally different thing. It's, it's different. We've been born, you know, we've been born again for a time such as this. We've been born again for this time. This means that God has preordained that this is the time that we should be alive. And you might think to yourself, oh, I wish I wasn't born during this pandemic time. But it's too bad God's chosen otherwise. He's chosen us to live at this very time in this very moment. I used to feel sorry for my um, kids and my grandkids for being born into this, this time. Linda sent me this the other day, and it was just, what a fantastic message from this guy. But he said, um, this guy said, but you know, the, the, our kids, our, the next generations have been born for this time specifically. They are prepared, they're mo you know, they, they have everything they need in them, and God needs to, they need to allow Jesus to come into their lives so it can be unlocked and unleashed in their lives so that they can shift and they can change it and make things different. But we're, we're, we're in exactly the right time. We're not random um, mutations of evolution that have just been born in this time for, for who knows why. God actually has a plan. God has a plan. He's, he's, he's purposeful. As I say, it's almost as if you can see the end from the beginning. So we know, we, there's no need to be fearful for our future or for the following generations because we're all equipped in Jesus' name even to deal with whatever it is that's happening in this world right now. So if you're feeling fearful about it, um, you need to choose not to be fearful because there's no fear in love. 
So um, just for the next couple of minutes, um, I'll, and I, I'm just going to finish on these things, but um, I just want to go through some of those things that Jesus has already done for us, what he's bought and paid for, so we can claim and agree to it, things that we can confess and believe. Um, and you'll find these in the Bible. It's easy to go home and find all this in the Bible. Um, I did. Yeah, amazing concept, eh? You can find it all. It's just like, if only I read it. Um, and, you know, ask God to speak to you while you read it. And, you know, possibly reading it for five minutes every day um, before you go to bed. Might, you know, there might be a bit of, like, meditation and thinking about it. So, number one, and I read some of these out last week, so I'll just go through them quickly. But number one, Jesus came to give himself as a ransom for us to pay the price for our sinful corruption so we don't have to live in that anymore. We can be free. So you're free of the corruption of this uh, world, um, of this, this sinful um, thing. You don't have to come under. You see, everything's been put under Jesus' feet. He's conquered it all. Praise God. Number two, Jesus came to show us the heart of our Father in heaven. Jesus said that um, if you've seen me, you have seen the Father. And how did Jesus come? He came meek and mild, gentle, humble. He came to serve and not to be served. Now, if Jesus Christ comes like this, should we? No. <laughs> no, the answer is yes. Gave you multi choice, you know, give you the answer. Um, he came to revive our spirits and our hearts when they are low. And I read that, um, I said that verse before about how God is high and lifted up, he's holy, yet he comes to dwell with the lowly so he can lift them up. Um, Jesus came that we'd never be alone. The Bible says that I'll never leave you nor forsake you. Do we believe that? Number five, Jesus came to revive the Sabbath rest for us to experience it now because it gives us an idea of what the eternal rest is going to be when we get to heaven. Praise God for that. We can look forward to, it, to that because you see the, the religious leaders and the Pharisees had actually broken the, the Sabbath. They'd broken it because of their brokenness. Um, and number six. Should we, should we go back a bit? Anyway, um, num number six. Oh, I have it. <laughs> this, this, this is, oh, I think uh, people are pushing the other buttons. Um, <clears throat> anyway, um, it's number six to heal the brokenhearted and set the captives free. Psalms 147.3 He heals the brokenhearted and binds up their wounds. So if you let Jesus in, even Christians every day, it's almost as if you have to let Jesus in to continue his ministry in your life. We have to choose to do that. He's, he, the Holy Spirit's already there. We're the temple of the Holy Spirit, but, but we, we need to let him in to continue his work. Um, number seven, he came to build hope in a new future for us. Jeremiah 23, 11, it says, For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans to prosper you and not to harm you, plans to give you hope in the future. Um, I know this was, the, this was the word of God to Jeremiah, but it shows the heart of God towards people. I can't believe that, just, that it just applies to Jeremiah. You can see the heart of God. You can see the heart um, of God. And number eight, everlasting peace. John 14, 27, peace I leave with you, my peace I give to you. I do not give as the world gives, do not be troubled and do not be afraid. You see, if you are troubled and anxious in your life, you can give it to Jesus and he takes that and he returns it with his peace because Jesus is the Prince of Peace. Yeah. And then 1 Peter 5, 7, cast all of your anxieties on him because he cares for you. Um, and I'll, I'm going to finish off this message uh, next week. But, you know, this morning, if you, if you are, um, there's two, two things I want to say, um, uh, two invitations. One, if you feel that you, are, you know, Jesus has really spoken to you this morning, you feel like you want to move from the corruption of this world into the life of Jesus Christ, then I want to give you an opportunity this morning to give your heart to Jesus. Because, you see, if the only way out of the corruption of this world and its mess and coming under its regime is to choose to be a son of God or a daughter of God, to choose to submit to Jesus. You see, that's the only way we get out of this is to say, Lord Jesus, I just accept you as my Lord and my Saviour in my life. I want to serve you. I want to give my heart to you. I want to, I want to try. I, I, I want to live in the spirit and not in the flesh anymore. I want to love what you love. I want to hate what you hate. And the other invitation is for anyone who feels like they just want a bit of prayer because maybe they feel a bit of brokenness in their hearts and you just need Jesus to come and some people to stand with you and Jesus to come and heal your broken heart. 
so that you can stop producing um, some bad fruit. And it's like your tree might have a bit of good fruit and a bit of bad fruit. Um, you know, all of, ours is, all of our lives are a bit like that. But we need to allow Jesus to come in and do his ministry so that he can heal our broken heart and bind up the wounds. Because you, you may have had someone wound you with violence or abuse, maybe rejection. Maybe your, your, your mother just really regretted the pregnancy. Well, that can, that can just, uh, that fills you, can fill you with um, uh, rejection. And, and, you know, Jesus can come and he, he, he takes all of that away and replaces it with just this life of Jesus Christ. So let's just stand. Um, is there a bit of music that we can put on? Um, perhaps?